inevitably, as most artists, I'm sure, have discovered, your art will reflect your life. And so how it is we live our lives, our expression, whether we walk across the room or we create something artistic or we blow up at our neighbor, it's all an expression of, you know, the way we have been living in our own minds and consciousness. There's a tremendous kind of courage that Jerry showed in the midst of the chaos of post the postmodern world and the individual loneliness of this world uh, that we've created for ourselves uh, to go his own way and in a way walk out into the desert and follow those minuscule uh, seeds and minuscule images which were just beginning to come alive in his own, his own, uh, his own heart but which to begin with actually precluded him uh, painting or sculpting or doing his art. In other words, you'd walk away uh, through your integrity and your courage from the very thing which other people uh, thought was most you. And you would walk towards something which even you yourself had not yet quite recognized. I've always walked into my fears and faced my fears and creation really sets the stage for that in that you take risks in creative in the creative process and in taking those risks you might destroy what you've done because you've gone beyond your own status quo but in taking that risk something inspired can come through and it takes it to a whole new level. We have this reminder in our uh, about the cyclical nature of existence, you know, in our, in our uh, sky every night. And we have the moon there going through all its different phases. And in a way, it's even there when it disappears for those three nights of the month where there's no moon at all. And there's something quite incredible about that disappearance, I feel. Yet, if you look at the way our society actually looks at existence. It's constantly trying to tell you and to tell our children that you should not acknowledge this disappearance at all, ever. You should always be waxing, you should always be growing, you should always be shining larger. And in actual fact, when you're going through the half of the month where you're beginning to disappear, you actually don't exist and there's something wrong with you. But if you look out of your window uh, on any given day, uh, you look out on a creation where there is nothing that doesn't go through the cycles of fluorescence and growth and decay and disappearance. But we look out and we want to be the one creature which is exempted from those cycles. Now the artist's task is to remind us that we belong and that we're like everything else, but we're like everything else in our own particular way. We're part of the great family of being. And part of the great family of being is being a part of this whole cyclical entrance and companionship with disappearance and death and uh, re-emergence. But again, I'd say, you can't go into the disappearing side of yourself solely relying on the fact that you will reappear in a different kind of way because you simply will not have the fortitude to go through the utter darkness you'll have to go through. You must, in a sense, make friends and form a kind of companionship with the disappearing light and with the uh, disappearance of yourself. I don't think we can see it ahead of time. That's part of being strategic. It's more like you take the risk and become that kind of vulnerable where you may die here in this place you just jumped into, and yet the gift comes through. It's, it arrives. It's more like, you know, that sort of proverbial, it's not by uh, works that we are saved, it's by grace. I mean, and whatever religion you're talking about, that still remains true. You know, you can't, you can't get there from here, which scares the hell out of most of us. And yet, to, to, a, to give yourself in a vulnerable way with that kind of innocent trust of, of the universe to provide and to deliver the goods, 
I think that's always where the greatest gifts come through. And that, I don't know that there's any life more worth living than that one, because the totality of your life becomes such a unique expression in the world that it's a gift to everyone, and it's most importantly a gift to ourselves. How much attention are you willing to give to the world, which I think is always... Uh is always the question the artist is asking of the rest of society. Will you look? Will you see? Will you hear? And uh, it seems to me that uh, Jerry had reached a place where he felt uh, he, he actually wasn't uh, paying attention in as full a way uh, as he could himself. And so he stepped off uh, into uh, that sweet darkness and that sweet uh, unknown, which to most of us is actually quite terrifying and made a friendship with the eye of that darkness and was able to see a reflection of himself eventually that was much larger than the person who was looking out at the world to begin with. When your eyes are tired, the world is tired also. When your vision has gone, no part of the world can find you. It's time to go into the dark where the night has eyes to recognize its own. There you can be sure you are not beyond love. There you can be sure you are not beyond love. The dark will be your home tonight. The night will give you a horizon further than you can see. You must learn one thing. You must learn one thing. The world was made to be free in. Give up all the other worlds except the one to which you belong. Give up all the other worlds. Give up all the other worlds except the one to which you belong. Sometimes it takes darkness and the sweet confinement of your aloneness to learn, to learn that anything or anyone that does not bring you alive is too small for you. I always feel these last lines cut both ways, you know, anything or anyone that does not bring you alive is too small for you. Because sometimes even your nearest and dearest, your loved ones cannot bring you alive. And then you have to ask yourself, you know, how am I looking at them? How am I seeing them? so that I've made them too small for me. What is, it in, uh, what is it that is diminished about my own powers of attention that's actually making the world too small for myself? There is a, a, a kind of proverbial pearl of great price, which I've always been interested in tapping into or finding. And to me, it is that reverent attention to possibility. It's that kind of trust that, okay, all the world is what it is, and there's not a whole lot I can do, and it's overwhelming to even try at some level. At another level, I feel like to tap into a place that brings life to everyone around me and to, you know, to, that inspires a moment is the best thing to be doing with my energy. And I believe, I believe if we could all do that, there would, a harmony would come out of that that would change the world, and it in fact does change the world. I think one of the great disciplines of existence, especially as we grow older, is, one of the, is the discipline of innocence uh, and of keeping uh, the sense of wonder and enlargement and surprise alive in your own heart. And the moment that you stop, uh, in a sense, living from your innocence, is the moment where you start to feel besieged by existence and, as, and the moment you need defenses and walls and no matter how high you build those walls, you know, the encroaching sea of existence will actually scour them away and uh, you somehow be revealed. Um, but because you've lived in exile from what is innocent and real about yourself, what frightens you most in life is your own happiness. And I think one of the great difficulties in life is claiming your own happiness. And I think Jerry is actually one of the few people I know who in a very quiet way has actually claimed his happiness and existence. It's like being in love. It's like a romance, you know? You're always waiting for the beloved. You're always, you're always courting the favor of the beloved in spite of yourself. You know, is, you know, that's not a strategy. It's like a holy longing. You're, there's a, 
there's a longing for that thing that makes all everything around you, including our own being, come more alive. You know, it's in the service of everything it comes into contact with. You know, that's like, that's what, you know, when you think about being in love, what that does, all of a sudden the people you hated, you love them too. I mean, you know, to sort of tap into the beloved, it's a gift to, to all of life. You know, it almost, I think it adds, and adds some kind of a substance to the ethers that make light the world a better place. You know, as I think it will create a butterfly instead of a mosquito. Mm -hmm. It's one of the great and awful kind of uh, difficulties that um, people find in their middle age um, as they start, as they, they've had many years of kind of logistical and strategic involvement with the world and they become strangers to their own innocent viewing of creation so that they can no longer see clouds, stars, woods, fields, even their own child's face without feeling they have to do something willful about it in order to belong, in order to feel they deserve some kind of participation. I think one of the most magnificent things about Jerry's life is its, uh, its profound and courageous uh, innocence. Uh, in that he, is, he has created a tremendous friendship with a part of himself which is, um, is in love with the world. And his artistry actually, uh, actually displays that. One of the things that we're desperate for now in the postmodern world is a first-hand experience of creation. And we're tired of talking about the world and we're tired of observing the world through uh, various media, and we want to be actually uh, present to it and affected by it in a very innocent way. And I think that Jerry's art actually celebrates this innocence. <laughs>